Hi folks, Steve Henry from ScalePoint here, your go-to for startup advice you can trust from people that have done it before. When you're looking for an offshore vendor, there's hundreds of them out there now, and you're probably getting emails and LinkedIn every single week for this. I see a lot of startup companies spending six plus months trying to find the right vendor, evaluating 10 or more of them, and it just chews up a lot of time. So today, we're gonna to talk about the top six things you should think about when you pick an offshore vendor, so you can make a decision with confidence and get moving forward with your org. Let's go. First one you'll want to consider, geopolitical. So this is the stability in the region, any regulations they have. A very important one to look at is working hours. So there's a number of countries, especially in the EU, as soon as you get past eight hours, there are mandatory rules for payment or minimum payments for the number of hours that they have to work. So these are things you're definitely gonna to wanna to look at. The other one you want to consider is vacation as well. So if you're working in the EU, for your offshore team, there's gonna be more vacation time, especially in the summer. In South America, there's a number of Festivo days. So please make sure you have these discussions so you understand when the vacations are coming up so you can plan for it. And also, are those included in the price? Are they separate? We recommend having a fixed stable price every month, right? You don't wanna be counting hours all the time. You don't wanna change it. You just wanna know exactly what it's gonna cost. Your CFO and your CEO are gonna appreciate that. And you don't have to review every bill that comes in. Number two, time zone. So seeing how you have alignment of your teams with their teams that they're gonna have is really important for you. You want them to be able to overlap and work well together. When you're working with the EU, one of the first discussions you can have with them is how much they will shift their workday, because that is very common. Having teams over there that will work till in Eastern time, noon or 2 p.m. is very common. If you're on the Pacific coast there of North America, this is gonna be a little bit more difficult for you. So have these discussions, understand how you overlap. If you're working with South America, a lot of this is much easier just naturally without anyone having to shift their day. Third point, language skills. This is a very important one. The biggest thing I would recommend is you want to treat this team like it's a part of your team. So if you guys are an English speaking team, having everyone on the team speak English and our recommendation is really important. Why? Otherwise, everyone's not gonna be able to communicate together. If they can only talk to one person who has to talk to the rest of them or certain ones, those people are gonna be ostracized, they're gonna be different. They're not gonna be part of your team in the same sort of way. And the other part is, especially when it gets into more complicated tasks that do require more interaction, discussion with products, maybe discussion with customers, more discussions back and forth, it's gonna be difficult to have and you're gonna be limited. And what you'll do is you'll start using that team for lesser tasks rather than giving them big things they can own that will actually motivate them as well too. Number four, talent base and tech stack. So despite what they tell you, the first thing you'll ask is like, hey, what tech stacks do you know? And they'll tell you everything. This is not true. So really do dive into it. Number one, if they did know all of them, then that means they have very few people in each. That's not really good for you. Typically, they're gonna have one or two primary skills that the most of their people work in, and you wanna find out what those are. One of the things you'll actually wanna look at is a lot of these offshore places, Microsoft set up there 20, 30 years ago, and as a result of that, there's a very big .NET base. So it's interesting to see how they evolved past that. If you're an AWS shop, if you're working in Node and React, do they have those modern skills that are available to you? So look at what's available, look at what most of the people do, and you really wanna do dive in deeper and see what they have available. Number five, pricing. So two things you wanna do here. Number one, have this discussion with them. A lot of times, your offshore vendors, they're gonna to wanna to tell you, well, here's typically what our price looks like, and they'll give you like a blended rate or an average rate. You need to go deeper than that because a lot of times this is a little bit salesy. So what is a senior, what is a junior, what is an intermediate? Is there anyone else you're charging me for on this? Are you charging me for a manager or a PM? We typically don't. If they're just a PM on the side and they're not helping, we don't recommend paying for that. So these are important to know. The other thing is we do find, for example, in South America, the talent pricing down there when they need to go to market and hire, which is how they're gonna get a lot of the new people on your team, that's not quite nailed down yet. So there can be a lot of variation on this, so it's really nice to understand what this is gonna cost, specifically for the skills that you need at the talent levels you need for your team. Six point, sophistication. So what really matters on this one is, is this a shop that's only built MVPs or have they been long-term real parts of companies before? There's a very big difference between just building something that works and building something you have to run and maintain after. It's incredibly different and it'll cause you a whole ton of pain later on if you don't build something with people that actually know how to build stuff that runs, maintains, and looks after itself. So what did we learn today? Number one rule we always have, 
Treat your offshore team like they're an actual part of your team. You want them to be motivated, you want to be have them included, and you want to be able to use them for the best work that you have available, not just the stuff that you want to throw over the fence. In doing so, the other quick things you'll want to consider, what are the overlap of the hours, can we align the times better? We highly recommend having really good English skills. Look at the actual pricing at a per level basis, and look at the tech stack that they actually have skills for. Really do dive into that. Don't forget, subscribe to our channel so you can see when new videos come up. For any of the artifacts you saw today, hop on over to our website, to our offshore playbook page, and you can download them. And if you ever want to grab an intro chat, there's a free 30 minute link in the description below. Coming up next, we're going to talk about the top 10 things that people tend to forget when they're setting up contracts with their offshore vendors. See you then.